my job here today is to convince you that the, uh, the testicles are maybe just as interesting as the prostate. <laughs> so uh, some of the objectives today is to review uh, some of the clinical implications of Klinefelter syndrome, uh, do a bit of a deep dive into the literature and, and some of the preliminary data that we've generated uh, for testis dysfunction and, um, and some of the implications of RNA sequencing and some of the single cell RNA sequencing that we performed. So we'll start off with a clinical introduction uh, to Kleinfelter syndrome. It's first described in 1942 by Dr. Kleinfelter. Uh, they reported a case series of, of nine patients that had gynecomastia, smaller sized testes, azospermia, and uh, increased FSH. It wasn't until 1959, however, that they identified the etiology being um, aneuploidy of the sex chromosomes with uh, 47XXY. This occurs in about 0.1 to 0.2% of live male births, and the 47XXY karyotype accounts for about 80 to 90% of men. The remaining 10 to 20% um, have um, mosaicisms and other uh, supernumerary X uh, chromosome. For example, 48XXXY, um, or there can be a, a mixture of the, the cells within the body. This is thought to be because of non-disjunction, uh, where when you have alignment of the chromosomes, the sex chromosomes fail to segregate appropriately. Uh, the majority of the time, this happens in meiosis 1 in eugenesis, and uh, with about 10% occurring in meiosis 2. In spermatogenesis, uh, this uh, Problems in meiosis 1 accounts for about 40% of the non-disjunction. This results in uh, a big variability in phenotype. So the majority of, of individuals with Klein-Felter syndrome may have one of these features, may have multiple of these features. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but classically, all the, the, the uh, constellation of symptoms uh, result in tall stature, gynecomastia, wider hips, uh, they have a propensity towards obesity, uh, decreased body hair, smaller sized testes, and the majority have a low serum testosterone, less than 12, uh, despite the majority not having symptoms of hypogonadism. Uh, the vast majority have infertility, and there's also some uh, behavioral implications with uh, some speech, social learning, delays, and uh, delays in <coughs> gross and fine motor skills. Now, we mentioned that the phenotype is extremely variable, and there's a few different theories of why this occurs. One is the degree of polysomy, uh, so uh, the, the number of additional X chromosomes has a positive correlation with the number of symptoms and symptom severity, uh, and gene receptor sensitivity, and CAG repeat variability is also thought to contribute to this. So uh, the longer the CAG repeats, we think that there's an inverse correlation with AR activity, uh, but there's variable results reported in the literature for Klinefelter syndrome. Some reports have um, uh, demonstrated that these longer CAG repeats correlate with more severe phenotype. And then there's a the question of uh, X chromosome inactivation variability. So there's a, uh, a long non-coding RNA called ZIST that uh, functions to inactivate the additional X chromosome, one or multiple. Uh, but we still know that 15 to 20% of the genes are still being transcribed on the silence X chromosome. So if we look a little bit closer here at ZIST, uh, on the top, this is the active X chromosome. So there's methylation at the site of uh, transcription for ZIST. So ZIST is not transcribed. Therefore, the rest of the chromosome can be transcribed and we get genes uh, produced off of this X chromosome. The additional X chromosome, however, ZIST is transcribed and this long non-coding RNA uh, then goes to prevent further transcription from that X chromosome with, you know, despite the 15 to 20% that escape this. So we want to look at some of the abnormalities with infertility and spermatogenesis. So Kleinfelter syndrome is the most common cause of uh, common genetic cause of infertility. It affects about one to two percent of infertile males. Uh, accounts for 0.6 percent of severely oligospermic men, and up to 10 to 12 percent of non-obstructive azospermic men. When we evaluate these patients, uh, about 15 percent will have sperm in their ejaculate, 
and the remainder will be azospermic. So of those, this is a production problem. So we'd perform a micro tessie and try to surgically retrieve sperm. Uh, reports of uh, demonstrated success between 40 to 70% of these men. Uh, and there's a lot of debate in the literature if this should be done earlier, kind of uh, around puberty, or if it should be done uh, later in adulthood, with the idea being that there's progressive changes in the testicle and germ cell loss. But uh, the consensus in the literature right now is um, that, that we're not really sure. There's some people in one boat and some people in the other boat, and I think it's the sperm retrieval rates are actually pretty similar. When we look at the, the sperm that we do get, either with the ejaculate or from surgical sperm retrieval, it's really interesting that you start, even with a non-mosaic Klinefelter syndrome, so all the cells that we can measure are 47XXY, but the sperm aneuploidy rate is only 6%, up to 6% which is just marginally higher than what we see in the normal population. So the sperm cells that are making their way through are still relatively normal. And the chances of having an offspring with Klinefelter syndrome is um, very similar, marginally elevated at best. So if we look at the testis, classically, uh, Klinefelter syndrome testis is described as progressive hyalinization. So if we look at the top uh, picture here, you can see that the basement membrane is very disorganized, it's thickened, and there's a lot of fibrosis in the interstitium. Uh, we have degeneration of the sperm cells and the, the somatogonial cells, uh, and this often results in uh, Sertoli cell-only syndrome. So we see some Sertoli cells within the seminiferous tubule, but there's no additional germ cells. If we compare this to the bottom slide, this has a really nice thin basement membrane, corporate peritubular myoid cells, uh, within the, the seminiferous tubule, we have a mixture of Sertoli cells and spranogenic cells from the stem cells at the basement membrane, progressing through differentiation, meiosis, and then we have the postmodic uh, spermatids and spermatozoa in the middle. So the question is, um, do abnormal germ cells contribute to defective spermatogenesis? Is it a germ cell problem or is it a somatic cell problem? Maybe it's both. Some insight to identifying what's going on with this is looking at the timing. So we know these individuals have less uh, spermatogonial cells and less spermatogenesis. Is this something that we're born with or we start with, or is this something that develops over time? So there's been a few studies that have uh, been descriptive at each stage, looking at fetal development, infancy, adolescence, puberty, and then uh, obviously in infertility literature, more in adulthood. So there's one study uh, that published on five individuals with uh, Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, these were fetal uh, samples and compared it to 10 normal controls. And what they found was even at the fetal stage, there's a reduced number of germ cells within the testes of Klinefelter syndrome individuals compared to those with 46XY. Uh, normal controls. From a functional standpoint, they looked at testosterone production in the early neonatal period, and there's uh, mini puberty in the infancy, and they found that the testosterone spikes between Klinefelter syndrome and normals was very similar. However, after the spike, the, the testosterone levels were a little bit lower in those with Klinefelter syndrome compared to normals. Once we go towards adolescence and uh, the uh, ages of puberty, uh, there was a study that had 14 individuals uh, with testis biopsies between the ages of 10 and 14. And what they found was that there is um, germ cell apoptosis with the first wave of spermatogenesis. And a lot of the uh, histologic changes followed this first wave of spermatogenesis. Again, functionally, with the onset of puberty, you have a spike in, in testosterone with a surge. And these surges appear to be pretty similar. So the lytic cells are responsive to the, the LH surge. But after, after that occurs, the testosterone levels tend to be lower than the 46XY counterparts. So this next uh, slide is a busy one, but it just depicts um, what we kind of see with these 14 patients. So the first half, the top half of this table represents the patients that have spermatogonial cells present. And these, these patients tend to be on the younger age of the spectrum, between 10 and 12 years of age. 
And their Sertoli cells appear to be somewhat normal. There's not very much lytic cell hyperplasia, and there's not very much fibrosis or hyalinization described. If we go down to the older half of the group, from 12 to 14 years of age, there's no more somatogonial cells anymore. There's degeneration of the Sertoli cells, increased latex cell hyperplasia, and significantly more fibrosis and hyalinization. And this is where some of the thoughts of uh, degeneration and with the first wave of spermatogenesis stems from. And it's been further corroborated with um, animal models, which I'm not presenting any of the data here today, but there's a 47XXY uh, animal model that has very similar findings to some of the things that we've observed with, um, with patients. <clears throat> if we look fast forward to, to adults, after this wave of spermatogenesis and all these changes occur, we result in this classic um, histologic phenotype that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, and even within that, there's some variability, but by and large, uh, they tend to be very fibrotic and scarred testis even when you're looking in to retrieve sperm from them. So uh, this kind of led to a question that we had. Um, are there differences in the spermatogonial regulation? And can we glean any insight to this looking at some of the data that we had generated using uh, next generation sequencing? So we had seven uh, Kleinfelter syndrome testis biopsies uh, that were sequenced, and we had 11 normal biopsies to compare these two. We then want to look at um, the canonical genes that are thought to be critically important in the regulation of spermatogonial cells and compare these and just really get a big picture view of what's going on with this. So we took the expression values for these uh, genes and pathways and put it into a software called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis to try to interpret some of the signals of what might be going on. So what we found here, if we look at the outside of, of this uh, pretty plot, uh, there's all the genes that we, we picked out that are thought to be critical with the somatogonial cells. Red is upregulated, green is downregulated. Then on the inside are the processes, uh, canonical processes that the, the software uh, links up based on the gene expression. And what we see is that in the Kleinfelter syndrome testes, there's significant upregulation of apoptosis and interphase and downregulation of cell replication, self renewal, and differenti differentiation. So, from a big picture perspective, what this is telling us is that perhaps the somatogonial stem cells, they're not doing very much. They're dying at a higher rate. They're not uh, replenishing the stock and they're not differentiating to go through spermatogenesis, which is what we see clinically and histologically as well. So what about the spermatogonia that do pro progress through spermatogenesis and become sperm? This was a really interesting study um, that looked at um, uh, different individuals with different types of aneuploidy and looked at the cell state in spermatogenesis and characterized the aneuploidy. So the, the diamond here was super males XYY, the squares were XXY Kleinfelter, and then the triangles were uh, mosaic Kleinfelters. The y-axis here is the aneuploidy percentage of the cells that were assessed. And then spermatogenic process on the x-axis, these are spermatogonia here, meiotic cells, post-meiotic cells, and then spermatozoa were the last uh, bin in four. And what they see here is that in individuals with aneuploidy, the spermatogonial uh, stem cells and spermatogonia are nearly 90% matching the, the karyotype uh, with aneuploidy of the germ cells. As you progress through spermatogenesis, we get to meiosis, there's a significant downregulation or decrease in the number of cells that have aneuploidy. And then by the time we get to sperm, there's very few cells that have aneuploidy. So there's a few ways of interpreting this, uh, but essentially as you get further along the process of spermatogenesis, either these cells are not fit and they die off, about 70% of uh, germ cells within spermatogenesis undergo apoptosis in the best case scenario. So perhaps this is occurring more frequently in these cells and only the, the uh, most select uh, normal type uh, chromosomes are making their way through. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this was a follow-up study uh, that was uh, quite interesting. Um, trying to ask a question, if we have 47 XXY cells to start with, and we result in, in 46 XY sperm, what's, what's the difference here? So one hypothesis is that you need uh, 46 XY cells to begin with, and only those ones are going through, or there's some kind of auto-correction um, and salvage through the process of meiosis that uh, you could result in this. And, and this study provides some insight that's probably the, the initial hypothesis. Um, so what they did was they took tubules uh, from men with Kleinfelter that had sperm found within the tubules, and then they looked at tubules where there were no sperm found and they performed a fish analysis to uh, characterize the chromosomes. What they found was that in the tubules that had sperm present, there were both these uh, 47 XXY, which were the majority of cells, uh, and these are spermatogonia at the basement membrane, but there was also 46 XY present. Not many, but few, and um, these would go on to, to create sperm is the hypothesis. In tubules where there were no sperm produced, there was no 46 XY cells. So supports the hypothesis, you probably need to start with a 46 XY mosaicism within the testis in order for that to progress through and create a sperm. And this is interesting because um, these are individuals without mosaicism in the rest of the body. So all the cells counted with karyotype have 47 XXY. But in the testis, we're seeing mosaicism amongst the somatogonia, uh, despite not seeing this in the rest of the body. So we'll transition to some of the dysfunction in Leydig cells. Uh, classically, in Klanfelter syndrome, there's Leydig cell hyperplasia in the interstitium uh, that's uh, most often described. Um, aromatase is, is interesting. So if we look at the clinical phenotype, um, gynecomastia, increased estradiol levels, decreased testosterone. Well, this relates to aromatase in, in some regards. So aromatase, we know, uh, converts <coughs> testosterone to estradiol. It's perfectly found, but it's also found within the testis as well. And what this group found was that the uh, aromatase intensity of staining was much higher in Kleinfelter syndrome <coughs> compared to normal controls uh, on the left here. And interestingly, um, follow-up studies looked at the aromatase activity from these cells and found functionally in vitro, there's about a four times upregulation in aromatase activity uh, compared to normal controls. So we know that lytic cells require LH for stimulation, testosterone production, and we know that estradiol negatively feeds back to the pituitary and the hypothalamus to shut this process down. But if we co-culture uh, these cells with LH versus LH plus estradiol, we know that there's significantly less testosterone production in the presence of estradiol, even at the level within the testis, not even looking at the negative feedback loop uh, with, with the pituitary of the hypothalamus. So this could certainly be contributing to the downregulation of testosterone production. Um, related to androgens, the androgen receptor uh, also demonstrates differences between normals and Klinefelter syndrome. So um, angin receptor activation leads to translocation to the nucleus, downstream effects on gene transcription, and further processes. So if we look at a normal testis here, we see that there's nuclear localization of the AR within Sertoli cells, within peritubular myoid cells, and also within lytic cells. If we move over to the Klinefelter syndrome, there's no nuclear localization of angin receptor within the Leydig cells. Um, so if we look at this brown blob of Leydig cells, uh, you can see little white dots, and those are the nuclei of the Leydig cells that don't have staining present uh, compared to what we see over here with, with lots of brown dots. <coughs> Additional uh, groups have looked at further characterizing these Leydig cells, and uh, they're finding that these lytic cells are maybe not in the end-differentiated state of uh, maturity. So this, this slide here, the top row is a 
pubertal Klinefelter syndrome individual. Uh, these two are adult Klinefelter syndrome, and then the bottom one looks pretty different, is a, a normal testis biopsy. Um, so CYP11A1 and whoops, INSL3 are, are both Leydig cell markers, and DLK1 is a gene that's thought to be involved in terminal differentiation of progenitor cells, and it's commonly uh, seen expressed in fetal tissue. And what we see here in Klinefelter syndrome is that there's significantly more expression of this DLK1 in this middle column all the way down in these interstitial cells compared to in the normal cell where it's only select cells of these progenitors coming off of the peritubular myoid cells in the interstitium that are thought to be feeding uh, the rest of the interstitial cells. <clears throat> so the same group uh, provide this really nice schematic uh, to think about it. So this left side here is normal and we see these peritubular myoid cells. This is the edge of a seminiferous tubule. We have this progenitor cell, high expression of DLK1. It goes on to have immature lytic cells and the progression of, of uh, transcription of INSL3 continues as we get to a more mature state. However, in these testes with lytic cell hyperplasia, we see a significant upregulation of these undifferentiated cells as well as immature cells with, with similar uh, levels of mature lytic cells. So the majority of these cells are abnormal and non fully differentiated. We looked at some of our single cell sequencing uh, when we were initially trying to make sense of identifying the cells and it was really difficult because the, the normal Leydig cell markers weren't coming up um, based on what we knew from normal test specimens. So um, a quick overview of single cell sequencing. Each of these dots on each plot <coughs> represent one cell. Within that one cell, we have information of about 2,000 genes that have been sequenced on this one cell. All these cells are then displayed on the plot, uh, which are yellow. If there's an expression of that particular gene that we've selected, the dot is between yellow and red, with red being the highest expression. So this top row of plots are the Leydig cell markers of mature cells. And we can see there's not a lot of cells that are lighting up despite the majority of the cells being uh, these interstitial, presumably lytic cells. So we started looking a little bit further at these progenitor markers, and um, uh, many more of these cells have a higher level of expression of the progenitor cell markers compared to the mature cell markers, consistent with some of the previous findings of, of select genes, uh, which we thought was pretty interesting. So we uh, then looked at our bulk RNA sequencing to corroborate these findings, and we compared the differences in log fold expression between Klinefelter syndrome and normal, uh, which is the blue bars, and Klinefelter syndrome and Sertoli cell only. So all these genes were uh, what we saw in the previous slide, marking immature cells. And there's significant upregulation whether we compare it to normal cells or if we compare it to, to regular Sertoli cell only. Um, so it's specific to, to Klinefelter syndrome. Now here there's obviously a, a soup of different cells going into the, the RNA extraction and the sequencing. So part of the signal that we see here is due to increased number of the cells of, of immature lytic cells. So if we look at next Sertoli cell dysfunction, um, let's back up a little bit and just talk about normal Sertoli cells and abnormal. So back in 1969, Skakabak described uh, mature Sertoli cells that have the appearance of larger cells, chromatin negative, uh, top here within the seminiferous tubule, and then immature cells are chromatin positive and much smaller. A group in 1982 went on to further characterize this into four cell subtypes with the most immature being in the top left and the most mature being in the bottom right. They examined uh, seminiferous tubules from men with Klinefelter syndrome as well as normal controls. What they found was that the Sertoli cells within the Klinefelter syndrome testis biopsies were much less differentiated, more immature, and there's also about twice as many Sertoli cells per cross-section as there was in normal. One hypothesis um, that exists is 
when the testa center goes growth with the addition of germ cells, those tubules will elongate and therefore space out the Sertoli cells a little bit. Because this isn't really happening in Kleinfelter syndrome and there's a, a paucity of spermatogonial cells, perhaps this is a more compressed picture that we're seeing and that's why there's increased number of Sertoli cells. Another hypothesis that people talk about is perhaps these Sertoli cells are de-differentiating or because they're in an undifferentiated state, they do undergo some, some cell division and therefore we have increased numbers. Um, a recent study just published this year uh, was comparing uh, three Kleinfelter syndrome testes and they performed some sequencing to three SCO testes. And uh, they looked at Sertoli cell uh, regulation and they also found um, an increased state of immature Sertoli cells where DAC2 is a gene that's previously been identified uh, with an immature state and is significantly upregulated in these uh, testis biopsies. They also showed similar results uh, with the Leydig cells being in a more immature state. So we looked at some of our data from a functional standpoint and two really key genes and, and proteins that are important in Sertoli cells to regulate spermatogenesis include GDNF and antigen binding protein. And if we look at the graph on the top, this is RNA sequencing data, and we can see that uh, Kleinfelter syndrome in gray is significantly downregulated compared to GDNF, as is antigen binding protein. Um, the lab previously had looked at GDNF within Sertoli cells, and they performed some additional experiments looking at flow cytometry and GDNF positive cells. And what they found is that there is two different populations in the NOA SCO cells compared to normals, and there's significant decreased numbers of GDNF positive Sertoli cells. When they looked at protein quantification, <coughs> they also found a significant downregulation of GDNF present in these Sertoli cells. And it's important because uh, GDNF is thought to crosstalk to some of the spermatogonial stem cells through GFR alpha-1, and um, it's thought to be critical for uh, support of early spermatogenesis. There is another in vitro study um, that was performed looking at the antigen binding protein. And when they took uh, these cells from tubules that had sperm compared to tubules that didn't have sperm within Kleinfelter syndrome, they found that the antigen binding protein production in vitro was significantly decreased in, in the cells from tubules without sperm. So we think that there can be a, a functional link here as well. So this next section is more of a, a big picture, 40,000 foot view, and um, just kind of looking at the forest and the trees. Um, there is this one paper that uh, did a big picture transcriptomic analysis trying to look for big picture signals. And they did it in a microarray for six azospermic KS testis biopsy, biopsies and three normal controls. There's a lot of upregulate and downregulate genes as you'd expect, partially uh, due to, to biology and partially due to differences in cell composition. And some of the top things that were different was there's an increased signal for testis cell death, apoptosis, inflammatory response, and altered seroidogenesis. Now we know inflammatory signals are part of regular signaling within the testis, whether it's with M2 macrophages that are native uh, within the testis or even amongst some of the somatic cells to the germ cells. A lot of the, the cytokines and interleukins um, are part of normal spermatogenic processes, but there is an imbalance here uh, with, with Kleinfelter syndrome. So their, their big take-home uh, point in the paper was that there is significantly upregulated up inflammation and apoptosis. And we want to look a little bit closer and see if we can understand this a bit better, again, kind of from a, a big picture view. Uh, is this apoptosis being internally generated? Are the cells being starved of what they need and therefore they're undergoing apoptosis? Or are these cell-to-cell -cell mediated death? So we looked at uh, our gene expression um, through the canonical apoptotic uh, cascades and uh, found that there's upregulation of of apoptosis, either comparing Kleinfelter to normal or Kleinfelter to SCO. And when we looked a little bit closer at uh, death receptor signaling, we also saw significant upregulation 
of this death receptor signaling, suggesting possibly that there is cell-to-cell mediated uh, death uh, that's at an increased rate compared to these other controls. So we then want to look a little bit closer and try to identify which cells are communicating and possibly uh, related to uh, the signal that we're seeing. So um, if we look at uh, the testicle within Klinefelter syndrome, similar to other conditions like <laughs> azospermia, we know there's heterogeneity within it. So <clears throat> this is a classic picture we would see in, in doing a micro -tessie. We see this bundle of seminiferous tubules that is dilated, and all the surrounding tubules are much thinner, more pale, and uh, less healthy. So these are the ones that we select with microtessy to pull out process with a higher chance of finding sperm. So we wanted to look at the differences between these two, the, the healthier looking tubules and the less healthy looking tubules to try to understand what is the difference in the process here that's creating this heterogeneity and possibly this links back to uh, the big picture of what we're seeing with uh, the sequencing results that we we identified and, and some of the other groups. So to answer this question, we looked into single cell sequencing. Like I described before, um, the, each dot here represents one single cell with all of the gene expression within that single dot that we can access. So we took uh, two biopsies of these dilated healthy tubules, two biopsies of these not so healthy tubules, and then we performed the sequencing and pooled it together. Now, each of these different colors um, represent different cell clusters. So what happens is uh, we ask the, the computer program to differentiate these cells and tell us what cells are similar to each other and what cells are different from each other. Uh, so it uses multiple dimensions and associations and spits out uh, these different clusters. And we can control how sensitive we want to look at this with how many clusters um, but it helps us differentiate subpopulations and unique populations of cells. So we went forward with this, and then we tried to identify these cells. So we look at one cluster, we'd ask the, the computer, what is the most uh, representative gene that differentiates that cluster from all the others? And then we try to localize where that, <coughs> that gene is expressed. So as an example, this particular cluster only expressed uh, fate one on this violin plot. And if we looked at protein atlas, uh, this gene was predominantly expressed as a protein within the Sertoli cells. So we performed this for all the clusters and tried to get a sense of what cells we were looking at, uh, what regions of those plots. <clears throat> we then looked at the differential expression between um, the collapse group and the dilated group to get a big picture understanding of what's the difference globally between these two. There's 81 differentially expressed genes that were common between the two specimens. Mm -hmm. And one of the top uh, overexpressed genes in the collapsed fibrotic tubules was this gene called IGF-BP5. It's an interesting gene because it's a pro-fibrotic factor and induces extracellular matrix production. And uh, we think may play a key role in, in Klinefelter syndrome testicular fibrosis. So, we map this out on, on our TSNE plots, and here the yellow dots represent all the cells that have igf bp 5 So this overlaps a lot with these interstitial progenitor cells that we had previously identified. We then looked at our bulk RNA sequencing data uh, for the entire gene family of igf bp We found there was a significant upregulation of igf bp 5 and 4 uh, in Klinefelter compared to both Sertoli cell only syndrome, uh, which are cell match controls, and, and normal condition. So, uh, there's been some work done in IGF BP5 and 3 that have been implicated in fibrosis and pulmonary fibrosis, hepatic fibrosis, and skin fibrosis. And um, IGF BP5 is the most conserved uh, member in the family. And uh, it's secreted by fibroblasts and is thought to induce production of these extracellular matrices, collagen type 1, fibronectin, all these same things that we're seeing in testis fibrosis. So this is um, an excerpt from one of these papers looking at lung fibrosis and we see a significant 
upregulation of IGF-PP5 and pulmonary fibrosis on the right uh, compared to uh, regular lung tissue on the left. Um, another interesting question that we wanted to ask was um, microRNA uh, can co-regulate a lot of physiologic processes and we were curious if we could find some signal with microRNAs potentially co-regulating uh, this process of increasing IGF-BP5 levels. So if we think back to microRNA biology, microRNAs are these really small, about 21 base pair uh, non-coding RNAs, and they can bind to RNA transcripts at this three prime, uh, lo three prime UTR location. And what it does is it, it binds to that and it signals uh, the RNA for degradation and it blocks translation to the protein. So if you have increased microRNA, you have decreased protein translation, um, big picture. So these three uh, microRNAs that we found were significantly down-regulated in the Klein-Felter syndrome testis, and they were found to bind the 3' prime uh, UTR of this gene, which is upregulated, which makes sense. Um, and we also found that, um, um, so, so we kind of stopped here, and uh, it's an association, and then some of the next studies would be looking at in vitro work, uh, confirming that this in fact <coughs> does bind the 3' prime UTR, and then doing some in vitro knock-up, knock-downs uh, to make sure that it does result in, in changes in protein expression. Um, then the final section here, uh, we wanted to uh, compare cell type specific differences between this dilated and collapsed tubules. So what we did here is we did uh, an analysis within one patient's um, biopsy, so there's no uh, inter-individual variation. And we performed this uh, jacquard analysis, which basically asked the computer which cluster is similar to the other cluster in the two different samples. So we can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So we did that and we found four cell types that, that we could compare. So when we did this, immune cells were, were reliably reproduced. And what we found was that in the collapsed tubules, there's a significant upregulation of proliferation, fibroblasts, and signaling for uh, connective tissue cells. <clears throat> and this is also conceivable that there could be an immune component in Klinefelter syndrome because there have been some uh, epidemiology-based studies that have linked Klinefelter syndrome with autoimmune type diseases, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and rheumatic disease. But we haven't previously described that there's an immune process uh, playing into the, the pathology within the testis before. We then looked at uh, what other cells could possibly be in communication with these cells. Well, these interstitial cells are also in the interstitium where the macrophages are typically seen. And from previous work, we know that even in normal signaling conditions, Leydig cells and immune cells have significant uh, bidirectional communication as does uh, Sertoli cells, pretuber myoid cells, and germ cells. So, what we found in these interstitial cells was a significant upregulation in signaling for type 1 collagen and uh, inflammatory pathways. So we think that there might be uh, uh, communication here between the immune cells and these interstitial cells that's leading to the fibrosis that we're seeing in these collapsed tubules. So in conclusion, um, we think that the dysfunction within the testis is multifactorial. There's abnormalities in the germ cells. There's abnormalities in the somatic cells, and maybe now uh, we're getting a bit of a glimpse that there could be some abnormality in the immune cells. Um, the somatic cells are in an immature state, both Sertoli and Leydig cells, and they're not functioning properly. We think that IGF BP5 may be uh, driving some of the fibrosis, and uh, there's hopefully future, future studies to better delineate this uh, in vitro. Uh, the germ cells are undergoing apoptosis. Um, we start out with less germ cells. They're not uh, progressing through spermatogenesis. And then there's a significant um, die off of these cells with the first wave of spermatogenesis at puberty. And uh, in the rare sperm that we do identify, uh, either in the ejaculate or with microtessie, we think that this is possibly uh, limited to regions of the seminiferous tubule where there is mosaicism 
And there's these rare 46 XY spermatogonial cells that produce um, sperm and go through meiosis. So that's all I have. Questions?